Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on the Chopin Nocturne in E flat major, Opus 9, number 2. This is one of the most requested tutorials ever in Pro Practice. I've actually never performed this piece myself, but I've taught it many times over the years, and I hope the insights offered today can help you take your playing level and practice efficiency uh, to a much higher level. Uh, I'll play a few bars just to get started in case you are not familiar with it, which I'm doubting because this is arguably Chopin's most famous work. same A section with some embellishments. And then it continues on. And then we have a contrasting B section, um, starting in bar nine. I'm sorry. to get us back to the A section. Okay, so this is kind of like a loose rounded binary form. Um, so we have A, the repeat of A, we have B in bar nine, we have the return of A in bar 13, um, and then we have B come up again in bar 17, and then we have another statement of A in bar 21, and then finally we have a coda um, from bar 29, 25 to the end of the piece, which the piece is 34 bars. So that's a nice loose way of um, keeping your memory straight is thinking A, A, B, A, B, A. Oh my goodness. A, A, B, A, B, A, coda. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Um, and then we have this little cadenza passage that tangles up a lot of students' hands that I've worked with. Um, we'll go, be going over how to do that efficiently. We'll also be going over the weird um, polyrhythms, like the eight against three, that trips a lot of students up. Um, but just knowing that structure in your mind, A, A, B, A, B, A, coda, that can really help you keep things straight. And there's things in that coda that are very reflective of the B and the A sections as well. Um, very similar in uh, melodic contour uh, with the B and the A sections. So that can help you keep things straight. I always like to start with uh, form when I'm studying a piece because that gives me an, a nice mental sketch. It's like looking at the blueprints of a house uh, before you get started building it. it, it makes things much more structured and foundationally secure in your mind. And we'll be going over um, different harmonic moves that he makes along the way. Okay, the first thing, I, I just wanna start with some basics of touch, okay? Because I've heard a lot of very poorly played versions of this um, from students over the years. And I think that if we get some very foundational elements with touch, it will set you up for success. The first thing is how do we keep that left hand soft? Because we need to make sure that our voicing, in other words, voicing out the melody, keeping the accompaniment soft is really good. Sometimes we'll also refer to that as balance, the balance between the melody and the accompaniment. So. How do we get that melody to really sing and how do we keep the bass really soft? The first thing I will say is depending on how bright your piano is, this can be a bit difficult, um, but no matter how bright your piano is, you still need to uh, strive for that. You may find though, when you get on a little bit more calm of an instrument that's not you know, beat to death, if it's a really old family heirloom piano or something, it is a little bit easier to voice. Um, nevertheless, how do we actually get that left hand to be brought down? And by the way, the only reason I bring that up is some students have come to me so frustrated 
and then they can do it perfectly um, in front of me on my piano. And they're like, why can I do it here? And why can't I do it at home as well? Sometimes it is the quality of the hammers or the quality of the piano. So I just wanted that as a precursor before we get into this. You may be able to do it better on certain pianos and that will, uh, and it's not a cop out. It's not saying, you know, you have to have the best piano to be able to do this well, but just wanted to clear that up. One thing I want to make clear is when you're in slower tempi, you have more leeway to play with a little more surface area on the key. So you'll see me playing quite flat fingered in this piece. It's not that I'm trying to hyper extend things to be um, you know, inverted like that, but um, I don't need to have really sharp fingers like you might need to in a more uh, quick or agile passage um, where a little extra curving of the fingers can really help to minimize surface area on the keys and move a little quicker. In this, we really want a little more surface area on the key. What that does, at least for me, it allows me to feel my arm weight transfer into the key very well. Rather than just trying to play it with your fingertip. First of all, piano playing should always come uh, as a holistic body experience, like you're feeling it all the way in your back, down your shoulder, especially from your forearm down, you're feeling that weight transfer. Okay, the other thing that I want to uh, preface good balance with is that piano is a game of illusions and everything is relative to each other. So is this loud? Or is that soft? Most people would call that piano or mezzo piano. Well, if I have this in the left hand, maybe this is a mezzo forte. So if you're on a really bright piano or you're on a really soft piano, you can adjust accordingly. If you're on a soft piano with brand new hammers, you're really gonna wanna play out in that melody. If you're on a piano that has a bright sound, a big sound, this piano definitely has a big sound, I don't have to project quite as much on the melody, but I really have to calm down that left hand. So we have a little more surface area on the keys, and we're creating about two dynamic levels of difference between the right hand and the left, maybe even three at certain points, okay? With the left hand, not only do you want to uh, have flatter fingers, but you can pull back slightly. You're probably not seeing too much of it. It's not a really pronounced pulling back motion. It's just a little bit of a stroke backward, which gives you greater control over that hammer speed. When you just play straight down, and I've had colleagues, and I'm not gonna name any names because I don't wanna embarrass them, but they've said, oh, don't even give me that. Um, nonsense that if you play like this or like this or like that, that it's going to have no consequence or that it's going to have a consequence over the sound. It doesn't make a difference. It just comes down to hammer speed. I'm like, yes, it of course, from a physics standpoint does. But when you're doing long strings of notes and you're having to move around the keyboard, wow, a little bit of movement backwards and a little more of a stroking back motion will keep your hand at ease. So yes, we're probably not changing the physics of how a hammer hits a string, but we're changing how we approach that and that can make a giant difference. So for instance, when I start this, I'm actually starting almost, so I'll start on the note, my pinky is placed on the note, and then I will come down and around and then I'll go back in just for a slight stroke back. And that will really help to start getting a much more intimate, innocent sound, which is um, lovely, which is what you definitely want to communicate with these. Um, John Field uh, is known for being kind of the uh, founder of the Nocturne, um, but Chopin, <laughs> Chopin's nocturnes are much better in my opinion um, and Chopin I think is the true master of, of this uh, genre and so we really want to uh, connect with that very calm feeling of like night music very calm peaceful innocence and this is being probably his most famous nocturne he ever wrote we really have a great responsibility to do that 
All right, going beyond touch, let's start talking a bit about shaping, and we'll get into longer phrases now, just not the first bar. <laughs> okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. 